All right. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back to our symposium. Uh, so we're going to kick off our uh, afternoon session. And as you saw from the previous talk by Dr. Corey, we're transitioning from plants to soil. Um, so our, our next speaker is, as you can see on the slide behind me, uh, Dr. Ratan Lal from uh, The Ohio State University, where he is a distinguished university professor of soil science and director of the Carbon Management and Sequestration Center. Um, interestingly, he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Iceland. <laughs> a little bit about uh, Dr. Lal. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from Punjab Agric Agricultural University, the Master's from the Indian Agricultural Research Institute in New Delhi, and the PhD from Ohio State. Um, he served for about a year as a senior research fellow in the University of Sydney, Australia. Um, for 17 years, he was a soil physicist at the IITA in Nigeria. And then since uh, 1987, he's been a professor of soil science um, at o the Ohio State University. He's co-authored or authored more than 900 referee journal publications, <laughs> more, than, uh, more than 500 book chapters, has written 20 books and edited or co-edited an additional 71 books. Um, so when we can't not say enough about his uh, productivity as a scholar. Um, he's included in Thomson Reuters' list of the most, world's most influential scientific minds and among the most cited scientists. He's received many. Um, honors um, in his life for many places. He's a fellow of five professional societies. Um, he's mentored 110 graduate students and 174 visiting scholars from around the world. He was president of the World Association of Soil and Water Conservation, um, former president of the International Soil and Tillage Research Organization, the former president of Soil Science Society of America, and is the current president of the International Union of Soil Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lau. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty. It's a great honor, Professor Brown, to be here, to be invited to this symposium in your honor. I really want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me. It's a great uh, honor to be here. I learned many new things this morning. Uh, most presentations were outstanding. Um, I want to begin <clears throat> with uh, talking about uh, what changes happened since the agriculture began. <clears throat> Initially, from about 8,000 BC to about 1750, <clears throat> gradual impact of agroecosystem, population was low. From 1750 to 1950, more drastic. And since then, very drastic. And this is what Paul Crutzen calls Anthropocene, where the human force is uh, having impact similar to that of geologic, uh, driven by population. Energy use, water use, uh, deforestation, gaseous emission, land degradation, desertification. Uh, if you really look at it, the answer to most lies in soil. And of course, with plants, combination, as Professor Corey said, <clears throat> I will be trying to explain to you that the soil really matters in most cases. And I will not like you to forget that. The <laughs> soil life nexus. A good soil, a spoonful of healthy soil, like the one which has earthworm in it, uh, contains more organism species than in the Amazon. And uh, Charles Kellogg from USDA, I borrow his statement, essentially all life depends upon the soil. There can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. Um, rhizosphere. We heard uh, from Professor Corey about uh, roots. Maybe the only site in the universe known where the death is converted into life. And that's a fact. Sir Albert Howard, many of you may know, the father of modern regenerative agriculture, was president of the Indian National Science Academy in the 20s. He said in his agricultural testament, life on the earth depends directly on the balance between producers, that's crops which have ability to fix solar energy, consumers, people and animals, and decomposers, the unknown or little investigated world of soil life. It was his presidential address which was entitled, the health of soil, plants, animal, and people is one and indivisible. If I were to add something in it, I would have said, the health of soil, plants, animal, people, and the environment is one and invisible. I think that's a 
leads us to the concept of soil health. And it's not recent. I would like you to go back to Moses. Many of you know more than I do. When his disciples were crossing into Canaan, you know what that is. He said, see what the land is like and where the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring me some fruit of the land. That are the ecosystem services summarized in that one paragraph. We haven't improved much on that. Kitab al-Falaha, an Arabic Moor, 12th century. He wrote, his name was Ibn al-Awam. He wrote a book, Kitab, book, al-Falaha, book on agriculture. The first step in the science of agriculture, the recognition of soils and of how to distinguish that which is of good quality and that which is of inferior quality. He who does not possess this knowledge lacks the first principles and deserves to be regarded as ignorant. <laughs> I think 7 billion of our present 7.6 billion may come in that category. Um, one must also take into consideration the depth of the soil, for it often happens that its surface layer may be black, and that the blackness of the surface layer that I'm going to talk to you about today. It was recognized in importance long time ago. So go back to the carbon cycle. Professor Corey showed you a much better diagram than I have, but I'm going to give it to you the soil version of it. Here's the atmosphere. Presently 820 gigaton. I have 800 going up by about 5 gigaton per year. It's increasing because 10 gigaton per year coming from the fossil fuel estimated at about 4,200 gigaton before the shale was recognized, discovered here in the US about a decade ago. So it's about 5,000 gigaton. And we are burning 10 gigaton per year. That means we are not running out of this very soon. And I hope, just like Stone Age and did not because we ran out of stone, I hope this will also end sooner than we run out of those fossil fuel plants. 123 gigaton taking from atmosphere every year. Her units are in CO2. These are units are in C. That's the only difference you see the big number changes. Uh, plant respire back 60. And uh, deforestation contributes about one. That arrow that goes from deforestation back into the atmosphere. 60 of that goes into the soil. And this plant contains total 620 gigaton. The soil to one meter depth contains 2,500 gigaton, two components, organic carbon and inorganic carbon. Inorganic carbon, 950 gigaton is more in drier climate than it's in the humid climate. In the humid climate, Midwest, mostly organic carbon. And we, personally, my lecture today, I'm not gonna talk much about inorganic, but it's very important in drier climates and in the irrigated agriculture. Leaching of bicarbonates is a very important process. Formation of secondary carbonates in soil is an important process which I will not discuss. Now, from soil, 60 is respired back into the atmosphere, leaving behind three, which is net ecosystem productivity. You notice another arrow going from soil in the atmosphere, 1.1 gigaton, by accelerated soil erosion by water alone. Wind is a different part. And then uh, about 0.6 goes into the ocean, which you can consider as possibly sequestered. And it is because that 0.6 goes into the ocean that uh, people sometimes think erosion is a sequestration. Well, for 0.6 to be buried in the ocean, 1.1 goes into the atmosphere. So the net is still a loss. Please control soil erosion as much as you can. If we know the flux amongst this major pool and we know the total pool stock uh, and the flux as was presented by Professor Corey also, we can calculate the mean residence time, which is essentially pool over flux. I give an example, say Ohio State has 60,000 students and we graduate 10,000 per year. That means the mean residence time is 60,000 by 10,000, that's six years. So that's how you calculate. So you can calculate this carbon cycle, budget, balance, whatever you call it, at a global scale, at it is now at a national scale, at a 
county scale, at a district scale, at a farm scale, at a watershed scale, more narrower the scale, like a farm scale or a landscape scale, that we know this information, the better off we are in management. We do not have that detail for that lower level. Now, the important part in terms of the climate change is the coupled cycling of the elements. And those are water, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. It's the balanced coupling of these, and these are coupled. We study them separately, understand, for simplicity's sake. But in nature, everything is hooked with everything else. And they are hooked together. And it is this coupling that creates the ecosystem services of carbon sequestration, water quality, net primary productivity, biodiversity, whatever you want to call it. And the danger lies either by human intervention or by climate change when this coupling may become decoupled. And that decoupling will cause many problems, such as erosion, such as by, this is by wind, of course, going back to the, the dust ball, the water erosion. And of course, many of you know that erosion leads to transport of carbon and clay. Erosion has a very good taste. It leaves behind this gravels and sand. It has no, no use for it. It takes only the clay, silt, and organic carbon because they have low density, light fractions. And there is carbon, especially in the vicinity of the soil surface. It's moved very quickly. We call it the enrichment ratio. The enrichment ratio of the sediments carrying carbon or the landscape by water or wind can be as much as 30, 30 times more enriched than the soil where it came from. Therefore, erosion preferentially keep removing and depleting the carbon concentration. And when it is deposited, wherever it deposits, it, depending upon the, whether it's oxidation condition or reduction condition, uh, nitrification or methrogenesis and denitrification, all the gases are emitted. So erosion is really a source of greenhouse gases. A debatable issue among scientific community, but that's the way uh, my data and my students uh, have shown. I don't need to remind you where this picture comes from. Another part of decoupling, the Lake Erie, Toledo. Remember four days, no water supply, algal bloom, 900 miles, the same problem. It's the ramification of the decoupling. When water not moving through the soil, but moving over the land, and carrying the nutrients and carbon with it. And it shows up this, which we have not solved that problem. As a result of this degradation processes, soils of most agroecosystems, not the newly cultivated land such as the Midwest, uh, that's only 150, 200 year most. I'm talking about the old cultivated soils, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Central Asia, many other parts, have lost as much as 25 to 75% of their original carbon stock. Somebody was asking, uh, what is the carbon sink capacity? I'll come back to that. And uh, that really is, I uh, had a cup of water here, but uh, I had drank some out of it. And how much can I put back? Well, how much I had drunk. That's all what I can put back. That is sink capacity created by previous historic depletion. And we have a lot of degraded land, about uh, 3.5 billion hectare. 24% of the total land area of the earth is degraded by things such as soil erosion by water, 1 billion hectare, by wind, another 0.6 billion. Salinization, which is going to increase very more dramatically. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, by... Um, uh, Climate change, salinity is going to be a serious issue. Secondary salinization, which is caused by irrigation, by bad quality irrigation water, and the poor drainage. It should be always drainage and irrigation, not irrigation and drainage. Drainage must be first. We should know where we are going to get the water out from the land. In this valley had that problem, still has. You keep on dumping water from the Himalayas, but you don't know where to get it out to. They want to dig it now a drainage canal all the way from Punjab to the um, Arabian Sea. Uh, it's very absolutely flat land. We're going to take the water away from. So that's an issue when you add water, you must also plan how to get rid of it. So how much carbon have we lost so far? I really do not know quite. But one of the articles I recently published in May, June issue of biogeochemistry, uh, my estimate was 133 
gigaton pyrogram. Uh, somebody else estimate is 135. So both of us must have made the same mistakes. Um, I think it may fairly change. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to it, how much can be put back in a moment. But that's an estimate. 133 pyrogram, you can translate into parts per million. 0.47 gigaton, uh, one gigaton is 0.47 parts per million, roughly, uh, at present. Um, so we'll come back to that in a moment. I want to go to on the topic of carbon sequestration. I borrowed a definition from Ken Olson here, uh, University of Illinois, a colleague of mine. We were classmates at Ohio State in the 60s. Uh, he's uh, based here. This is a definition that he wrote I was one of his co-authors for the Salt Sun Society of America, is the process of transferring CO2 from the atmosphere into the soil of a land unit plants. Going back to Dr. Corey's plants and the roots of those plants, but within a land unit. I'll come to explain what that I means because that causes a lot of problem with it. Plant residues and other organic solids generated by those plants, which are then stored and retained in that unit. I keep on emphasizing that in that unit because sometimes you take biomass, say plant residue mulch from somewhere else, or you graze cattle somewhere else and get the manure from them and bring it to that land, another land, and you think you have sequestered carbon, no, you have redistributed it. You must account for where it came from because that land must have lost it. And that's a very common, so this definition is an important part within a land unit. The plants growing in that unit photosynthesizing within that and retaining their biomass and the roots, especially the root within that land unit and being sequestered. So how does this process happen? I was giving you the example of water. So see, so much water is less, so I can put that much back. If I have drink more, I can put more back. So when the deforestation or transfer of, transformation of prairie happened in the Midwest, uh, let's say around 1800, we had 100% uh, carbon stock uh, in the beginning, and within 50 years after deforestation, after conversion to agricultural land, the carbon stock declined to about 50%. I was doing the same experiment in Nigeria and many other parts in West Africa. This, which is 50 year in the temperate climate, it was five to 10 year in the tropics. The rate of decomposition is much higher. Remember the uh, lot, the 10 degree uh, quotient, if the temperature increases by 10 degrees, decomposition rate doubles. So if the soil erosion that I showed you continues, then the depletion rate of carbon continues very rapidly. If the erosion is controlled by somehow, the carbon stock reaches an equilibrium within that land use, soil management or cropping system or whatever it is. And at that point in time, if you adopt a better practice, whatever that practice might be. It follows a sigmoid curve to increase all carbon stocks, slow rate of accretion in the beginning, uh, at 2025 year reaching an equilibrium, the highest rate perhaps five to 10 years after. So in about a generation reaches an equilibrium. At that point in time, if we adopt another better practice, uh, we can perhaps go another sigmoid curve and higher up. In some soils, especially soils which have some deficiency in their native conditions, phosphorus deficiency, aluminum toxicity, low pH, maybe lack of water or something like that. It's possible to go even beyond that with the improved species that Professor Corey was talking about, the root system. In this case, if you have this slope of that line, you calculate delta Y or delta X, that's the rate of carbon sequestration. This cannot be done overnight. It cannot be done one or two or three years. Maybe PhD student can do three or four years, some points, better done in generations, 20 years, 25 years, 50 years. So when somebody say, when can you, how quickly can you sequester carbon? Well, over generations, uh, not overnight. And that is the part which sometimes is against soil carbon sequestration or biotic sequestration, because it takes time. And the normal time horizon for people is four years, okay? After that election comes and we must keep changing. So uh, four, if you can't solve a problem in four years, forget it. And that's normally what this question is. Could you give us funding support? How long will it take you? 25 years, forget it. So that's what happened. Now, from this one, we can calculate the carbon sink capacity, where you are in relation to where you were before you converted the land. 
that the carbon sink capacity. It can be related to clay content, clay mineralogy, depth, moisture regime, many other things. We can calculate the mean residence time by knowing the pool over flux or that. And we can define what's context specific or site specific land use and management systems are. People talk about one system, biochar will do it, or conservation agriculture with no-till will do it, uh, agroforestry will do it, regenerative will do it. We have 300,000 types of known soil series in different climates, in different biological regions, in different biomes, in different landscapes, in different human dimensions, culture, traditions, custom, religion, you name it. To expect that one system will work universally is being naive. But we have some preferences, uh, several examples, conservation agriculture, regenerative agriculture, integrated nutrient management, pest management, biochar, agroforestry, desertification control, afforestation, pasture management, water harvesting, drip sub-irrigation, farming system, many things. People talk about it. There's no one silver bullet. That is site specific. That's where you have to find it. But more important part, which we always forget, each one of these practices, doesn't matter how good it is, it has its own carbon and water footprint. <coughs> Nothing is free. Each one, you spend something. Therefore, from the gross rate, delta y or delta x, never ever forget to subtract what you spent in doing it. And that gives you the net rate. And sometimes you do not have that net rate. Enthusiasm uh, uh, takes the overriding part. Basically, soil is a bank account. You have to balance the bank account. If you want your bank account to be increased, your input into the account must be more than the output that you take out. So input into the account is those practices I listed before, compost, biochar, any money other. And what are the losses for each system? Of course, erosion, leaching, decomposition. You must have to know those three quantitatively so that you can always add more than what you're losing. And if you cannot, then uh, we have the opposite side uh, where you are uh, having always depleting. When I was in Africa, somehow I could never balance these. So I was always losing. I tried my best, but I couldn't because the decomposition rate and erosion rate was so high. So the question was, can you really do it? Yes, I can, but somehow I have to go beyond that. So I have to produce more. I have to go back to what Professor Corey was talking about, root system that produces more than those losses. And that's where putting plants and soil together is a very important part. And the other thing is soil is an ecosystem property. Subrin, yes, it's important. But molecular structure does not always control it. The environment have an overriding factor the temperature, the moisture, they, they do play a very important role. Environmental, biological control predominate in most cases. That's why in Africa I had a problem uh, over 17, 18 years. And the mean residence time of the fire-dried biochar, that the fire-dried, I mean, widely believed to be recalcitrant, also depends on the physical protection. If it's buried deeper, if it somehow get integrated with clay minerals, then its mean residence time is more. So there are trade-offs, which also we should consider. That's management, soil, plant, animals, water, nutrient, tillage, phytoengineering, cover crops, residue can play an important role in finding out the increase in the mean residence time, which is very, very critical part. So there are many mechanisms of stabilization of carbon. Uh, certainly, uh, there are physical access to microbial processes, stable microaggregates, where you lead to formation of organomineral deeper placement. Uh, Professor Corey mentioned that quite uh, uh, often. Absorption on clay particles, formation of organomineral complexes, <coughs> supramolecular structure that we were talking about, uh, formation of selective preservation of molecules, recalcitrant substances. Uh, Subrin is very a good example, clay hatches, and of course the ecosystem properties. There are many possibilities of putting carbon in soil and then protecting it, making sure it's not rubbed by microorganism. When I'm talking about clay organic mineral complexes, here is a polymer, and the polymer, because of the charge on clay particle, is absorbed, and that is difficult for microorganism to access. It's really locked in there. Formation of organomineral metallic cations serving the bridges between clay and organic polymers also does the same thing. 
So we have these uh, components which are very important to stabilization of this. Here is why I could not increase the carbon stock in African conditions. Here is an example. You have crop residue and you want to make it into humus in soil. Uh, here is the situation. The carbon to nitrogen ratio in residue is 100. In soil, it's 12. Carbon to phosphorus ratio is 200 in residue. In soil, humus, it's 50. Carbon to sulfur ratio, 570. Humus is enriched in nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and other micronutrients. I was only eating carbon, as much as 30 tons of it. I had no nutrients. And there are no nutrients, you can't do anything. You find it out later. After many years of experiment, what's wrong? Well, that was wrong. I didn't have all the building blocks. So understanding scientific part is very critical to that. So it's not NPK in terms of the nutrient, C and PK. You want to add carbon, C. Do not forget, whether it's a root carbon, shoot carbon, root carbon is more effective. So always put C in front of that. So C and PK rather than NPK. And therefore, this thing, to expect farmers to do this for the global common good, it's not proper. It never happened. I was doing those experiments in Nigeria in 1970. Nobody ever did it other than my own experiment plot because it cost money, it cost resources. The crop residue is expensive, the nutrients are expensive. The total cost about $120 a ton of carbon accumulated. And if you do not pay, let's say in Illinois here we have half a ton of carbon sequestration per hectare. That means farmer is contributing to the society $60 per hectare worth of money. And if you expect those farmers to do it without any reasons, uh, I'm not sure they will. So whether you consider not, so the payment, at least for the rates I have monitored in the Midwest, $16 per acre per year, $40 per hectare. That is the basic cost. You don't pay them, you're not going to get it. At least most farmers of the world, 600 million resource per farmer, they cannot do it. They have no resources to do it. I don't think many in the Midwest can do it either. And that brings me to the question of agriculture. I'm going back to Dwight Eisenhower's lecture here in Illinois. I want to pick up a quotation from him. He said, farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles in a White House somewhere. Um, that was addressed at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, and that brings me to the question of agriculture then. You know, he said it's mighty easy that way. 40% more than actually of the Earth's land area is used for agriculture, 40%. 75% of agriculture land, that's almost 4 billion hectare, is allocated to raising animals. 70% of all water used in, in the world is used for irrigation. 30 to 35% of greenhouse gases emitted are contributed by agriculture, directly and indirectly. And yet, one in seven people is hungry. Two in seven people, are, two to three in seven are malnourished. So something is not right. Something has to change. We cannot add more water, we cannot add more nutrients, we cannot bring more land area. We are already doing too much. So how do you feed the people? I think we are already producing enough. I think we are producing enough food already to feed 10 billion people. You know, out of three gigaton of grains produced, one gigaton never reaches the stomach. It goes into the landfill. That's a waste. Wasting one gigaton of grain produced with all those inputs is a crime against nature. Doesn't matter how else you call it, but that's exactly what it is. So let's stop that somehow. Education, education at all level. Increasing access to food, which is poverty. It's a inequality, it's wars, it's political instability, it's refugees, whatever, 65 million refugees knocking at the door of Europe, some of them, destabilizing the Europe. Improved distribution. In one part of the world, the food exists, a few miles away, it doesn't. There's no access. Increasing use of plant-based diet. I really salute Professor Brown about, he told me last night he has been vegetarian for 30 years, and everybody else was vegetarian. That, that's great. Plant-based diet. How about having protein, which is plant-based? How about producing fish, meat, looking substances, which are plant-based, from mung beans, or soybeans, or tofu, or whatever? 
I, th I think that's a, that's a direction to go, rather than what is happening in developing, accepting personal responsibility. Each one of us, each one of us, 7.6 billion. If we make a small difference, multiply by 7.6 billion, would make a big, big difference. And then increasing production from existing land, restoring degraded land. Remember 24% of the land degraded, restore. Increasing biological nitrogen fixation and converting some land back to nature. Do not keep clearing more land, put it back to nature. If we have 8.7 million known species and human being taking 40 to 50% of it, we are really greedy as a species. Give it back to nature. Through how? Through sustainable eco-intensification. And what is sustainable eco-intensification? That is the idea that we must reconcile the need of advancing food and nutritional security with the necessity, necessity, essentiality of improving the environment. We must do that. Remember that algal bloom issue, remember the water erosion, remember the dust storm, remember the problems of uh, desert, desertification. Somehow we have to overcome that. And what does that mean is we need to produce more food perhaps from less land, from less water, from less fertilizer and pesticides, from less energy, from less carbon emissions. We must produce more and more from less and less by improving the efficiency of the system. Our fertilizer and water use efficiency hardly 20%, 30%. In best case scenario, 40%. Can any business survive where you have 70% losses out of it? Not possible. We keep subsidizing rather than telling we must stop those losses. We must improve the efficiency. So if we did improve the soil carbon stock, the crop yield can be increased at the same level of input for maize, soybean. These are global data that I uh, compiled. And we can increase production for every one ton increase in carbon stock in soil, top soil where the roots are, uh, about 30 to 50 million tons per year of grains. So if you can increase by 10 ton, you multiply by that by 10. So that's, there should be plenty of to improve the efficiency. The critical limit to improve is 2%, 2% in the road zone. It varies from soil to soil, region to region, but in general, it's about 2%. This is what happens if, if you do not. These two plots are the plots which I had along with our colleague from Texas A&M. He was Professor Jewel, uh, colleague who are there may know him. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, we set up this experiment in 72. This picture was taken in 87. The only difference between the two plots is the one in the front. We remove the crop residues away. So the organism, earthworm, termites, microbes had no food to eat. We killed the soil. The dead soil cannot produce ecosystem services. You can see you do not need statistical analysis to see the difference. So soil biota is really the engine of, uh, and if you take away the crop residue for biofuel, uh, that certainly has a cost. We repeated that experiment in Ohio, 2012. There was a big drought in Midwest. No till. We were talking at lunchtime. Both these corn are no till. Uh, since 75, these plots have never been plowed. The one where on the left with Josh Benison, about six feet eight, standing there, the residue was taken out since 2004. This picture was taken in 2012. The one 10 feet away, even with a drought, the residue was always left on the soil surface. I have repeated the same experiment in Mexico, in Brazil, everywhere in the world. So what is uh, climate resilient agriculture? That's it, you're looking at it. Put this share of the land, the soil structure is destroyed by plowing, it's intact when the crop residue, ground always keep it covered, always keep the ground covered. And the rate of carbon sequestration, the best possibility is restoring wetlands. We have drained many of them. CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, put the trees wherever you can. Home lawns have a very good, you know, we destroy the soil by bulldozing, leveling, and all that. Uh, put the tree shrubbery back on home lawns. It's a very no-till in the Midwest. The rate is about half a ton per hectare. Uh, rangeland, because they're on dry land, the rate is about 200 pounds per acre or 200 kilogram per hectare. Uh, here, again, experiment going back to Ken Olson, uh, his experiment in Southern Illinois. If you grow cover crop, uh, you can sequester about uh, almost one ton. 
to 75 centimeter depth because cover crop also add nitrogen into the soil. Remember the nutrient which I was talking about. So on a global scale, on an annual basis, if we provide the incentive to farmer to do better agriculture, we can sequester about two and a half gigaton of carbon per year. We are not doing it right now. Right now it is not possible, it's not happening. But we can do as much. And uh, by 2100, we have an article coming out next month. Uh, we have a potential to put 330 gigaton, both in trees and soil, which translates to about 150 parts per million of CO2 drawdown. Doing that, is it technically feasible? It requires political willpower, education, communication with the policymakers. And I'll, I'll come back to that toward the end. This article is coming out. We have just done the proof, Kelly's. Uh, 15 of us have written that uh, from all over the world to show what the potential is in the vegetation and in the soil both. If we did that, it is very possible that we can decrease the land area under cereal. Actually, this number uh, right now is 750 million hectare under cereal grain. I think we can reduce by 2100 to 500. <clears throat> the fertilizer use from 200 million tons, we can, I think, cut it down to 100 by improving the efficiency. Yet the production can be more than doubled by improving the. So, that is the idea of produce. While the population go up to 11, we can feed population on lesser area and lesser fertilizer and other. The idea is use the best, save the rest for nature. That go back to nature. That automatically sequesters carbon into the system. Um, that was, I don't know what happened to this particular slide, but went a uh, little bit, uh, the computer had its own mind there. Um, I have summarized the plant that Professor Corey had a very nice, good uh, root system. She had a subrin there. I should put sub subrin as well. Mycorrhiza uh, is a very important uh, part in the root system. Uh, we want to always have a mulch on the ground. We want to keep a cover crop. Never want to plow it. Uh, we have machinery to do without plowing. And we should have plants that I hope we can talk to through molecular-based signal. I would like plant to tell me, look, uh, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I need nitrogen. A grasshopper is chewing my leaves, or a, a virus is uh, taking hold of my roots, a nematode is biting me. They have different molecular-based signals, so we can intervene before very large damage can happen. Uh, I hope plant physiologists, uh, plant breeders can provide us that. I don't want to use GMOs in case some people take that as an offense. I do not know what you want to call it, but I do want to be able to communicate with the plants uh, so that they can talk to us somehow through molecular based signal that you can detect by remote sensing, flying over Midwest United States on the corner soybean and say, oh, that area has a problem. We must intervene soon. And then link up with cattle and trees wherever possible so that we have a complex, uh, complex system so this is, I think, the future agriculture look like. Now, this picture, something is missing. The nutrients, um, NPK, zinc, C, they should be given at such a point in time when the plant needs them the most, and there's a less wastage, and the most of them, at least 75, 80% of them, are absorbed. So the root system should be really receptive of those nutrients and water. So I fully support what Professor uh, Corey had to say this morning. I think I'm coming to the end. I want to mention that uh, there's a lot of talk about world peace, and uh, I think the two Peace Prize people uh, this year did a great uh, job. They got a very deserving award. But we also have a talk about uh, controlling, controlling um, nuclear dissemination. Uh, here is my take on it. Depleting soil organic matter, declining soil fertility, degrading soils, denuding landscapes, recurring drought, intensifying heat waves, secondary salinization, increasing elemental balance, reducing water renewability, exacerbating scarcity, contaminating water and polluting air, low crop yields and perpetual hunger, poor nutrition and increasing malnourishment, marginal living and desperateness are as real threats to global peace and security as our ICBM and nuclear weapon proliferation. 
The trouble is we don't recognize it. That's a problem. And why is it? Because the fire that burns in the pit of an empty stomach is so intense and so ferocious that can only be quenched by the divine powers. And I want to repeat the word divine powers in a loaf of bread made from grains grown on a healthy, nutritious soil. That the only way the peace can, when you have 65 million people, refugees, hungry, desperate, you want them to be steward and you want them to be peaceful, you want them to be, not possible. That the only peace will come. And I wish United Nations knew that, that this is the only path to peace. I wish the Peace Prize giving committee knows that, that the basic part we leave out. Uh, we are ta- always worried about nuclear and bomb. And the, the, the thing which really, think, take a very typical example in Nigeria. There was a Lake Chad, a beautiful lake. I had seen in the 70s, uh, very nice fishing villages, farmers on draw down vegetable grain. You go to see that lake, now it's a mud puddle. What happened to those farmers? You know what happened to them. They became mercenaries. They became Boko Haram. It's very easy to buy them and people have no resources when they're desperate. So the path to peace really is providing the basic necessity, going back to the basic roots, which is the soil. So here is an example. You talk about social security, political, economic, social environment, but the gender security, 70% of farmers in developing countries are women, ethnic security, national. At the heart of all that is a healthy soil. When the soil is healthy, it has that organic carbon concentration, 2%. That is when you have food security, you have water security, you have energy security, you have climate security, you have nutritional security, you have environmental security, you have political security, you have national security, and you have global peace and tranquility and harmony. (laughs) Otherwise, you can't have it. You, You can look at it. It is the people who are desperate that they cause the problems, they jump into the Mediterranean, if you want to call it, they don't care whether they die or not, and they knock at the Europe or they destabilize the Europe. You look at, go back three, four years, what has happened? I won't not give a name, but that's really the root cause. The last thing I want to mention is what are the ecosystem services that the soil provides? You have a soil base, resources, you have organic carbon, and it has a pyramid. The base of the pyramid is the basic soil resource and carbon stock. One side of the pyramid is food and nutritional security. The second side of the pyramid is the climate change adaptation mitigation that you're talking about. I really salute Professor Brown for giving that suggestion. The third side of the pyramid is water quality, a land restoration. The fourth side is the biodiversity part. This pyramid is stable as long as the apex you remember that Egyptian pyramid, the top have a cap to make sure it stays stable. That apex has a glue. That glue holds it together. That glue is the political will, governance, policy makers. Our senators and Congress going through election now, have you heard anybody talking about natural resource management and restoration on any platform? I think this is where we are lacking communication with them. And that's the part which I think I would like to mention that when asked what I suggest to mitigate global warming, purify air and water, and end global hunger and malnutrition, the logical response would be to change the ways soils are taken for granted and abused to produce, transport, process, and consume food and misused to procure feed, fiber, fuel, bricks, and other ecosystem services. We do not use them, we abuse them. A prudent strategy would imply making soil, water, and agriculture an integral part of the solution. Not keep blaming agriculture. How can you blame agriculture when we all like to eat three times a day? If you decide today don't want to eat, yes, I will respect you then. Okay, you don't eat, you can blame agriculture. Not, (laughs) make don't. And then we must empower farmers and land managers, empower them to produce more and more from less and less by reducing waste, enhancing the eco-efficiency, restoring degraded soil, afforesting the denuded land, and saving soil and water back for nature. I really salute you for choosing this topic and for inviting me. Thank you very much.
appreciate it. Do you have a question? Okay. We have time for a few questions from the audience. Back. So I, th I think that um, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, it's economically hard for poor farmers to to invest in that way. And so the only solution that I see out of that is for not only for the United States government to invest in those farmers, like say, pay them to do this, but also for the first world to actually pay third world countries to participate in this. Is, is that what I'm Yeah, that's why I had that slide. Um, if you remember um, 2015 climate summit in Paris, uh, French government declared a program called Quatre per Mille, four per thousand. That program was actually discussed in my lab. The French minister and his advisor came to my lab. We went to see some farmers also around Columbus, Ohio. The idea was, can we put carbon back in the soil at the rate of 0.4% per year, globally, to 40 centimeter depth, 16 inches depth? Right now, the rate is not even 0.05%. But that is what would take to fill that same capacity. To do that, you need to put the crop residue back. You have to up supply additional nutrients. There's a water requirement. There's a land requirement. 700 million small landholders who do not farm more than two, three, four, five acres. Even the large farmers, commercial farm in the Midwest, cannot do it. I had asked the minister when he asked me a question about how much resources, I told him $64 billion. Where did that $64 billion? 1,500 million hectare global cropland area is 4,000 million acres. Multiply by 16 is $64 billion per year. How long? Next 25 to 50 years. That is what it will take. When they demanded $100 billion, I will not tell you which country gave them $1 billion. And that one billion since then was taken back. The program not going anywhere. We talk about it. We sign agreement. We don't implement it. It's not a subsidy. It's a payment for ecosystem services. We are asking them to mitigate climate change. We are asking them to purify water so there's no algal bloom. We are asking them to increase food for microorganisms so that the soil biodiversity increases. We are asking them to improve the environment. You cannot expect them to do these services free. Not possible. They don't take us seriously. Yet, farmers and land managers are the largest steward of environment. They hold the, the rain. We must support them. We have to support them. We have no choice. That's a wonderful talk. I really appreciate what you told us. I have just a specific question about there's so much land in the world which is desertified, uh, lies barren, and, un, uh, and it has very little to work with, right? There's no root system anymore. What's the process by which those sort of wasted lands can be restored to a system which is uh, sequestering yeah. well, Very good question. It's, uh, that is the first priority. Those are the soils which are most depleted. These are the soils which have a very large carbon sink capacity. So somehow we have to reverse the degradation trend. It, in the beginning, the rate of, because it follows a sigmoid curve. So what is the controlling factor for biomass? Two, water first, nitrogen then. So both require input. Conserve water in the root zone wherever you can and supply nutrients, nitrogen, especially nitrogen. Their legume, leguminous trees would certainly help. Uh, and I think that process, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the United Nations has adopted a program called Green Wall. And the idea of a Green Wall is that across Sahel, uh, let's say 50, 60 kilometer area, we put uh, uh, shrubs and trees. 
And this program, Green Wall, exactly is designed to do what you just, just suggested. But it will not happen without inputs. Uh, you need seedling, you need then water conservation, you need uh, nutrients, and you want to make sure that uh, those uh, lands which have the uh, vegetation is established is not a common grazing land, otherwise it will become tragedy of the common. So that education become uh, very important, especially education of the women that we discussed uh, before. I think that process certainly has a potential. Uh, it can do what we just said, 160 gigaton between now and 2100. But global leadership really have to come together and uh, implement uh, the way uh, they think uh, they should do, uh, they should say it. I, I do want, while talking, one more thing I want to mention. Uh, you know, in the US, uh, we have a uh, kind of plan to reduce carbon intensity, not carbon emission. We had agreed a long time back that we will reduce carbon emission. Carbon emission is defined as total emission divided by GDP. So if the GDP is going up, let's say 3%, our carbon intensity automatically goes down. So who copied us? China. China was the first one. We will do the same. Their GDP is going up 7 10% per year. But they didn't have to do anything before their carbon intensity goes who are the next people to follow them? India. So nobody is really doing reducing emission. So somewhere we have to come together and discuss uh, how to, but restoring degraded land, which are formerly agricultural land, is the best place to start. And it has a potential. It certainly has a potential. Miami goes completely underwater. So how much would that cost versus the 64 billion? I think. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot. The con conserving water in the roots, is, the idea is that the, we conserve water where it falls. Keep the ground covered. So if the ground is covered by crop residue mulch, the rate of evaporation will decrease tremendously. I monitored, for example, in West Africa, many, many uh, countries, uh, how much soil water storage can be improved simply by not plowing and keeping crop residue back. Temperature change, soil temperature, I'm not talking about air temperature, soil temperature, from 55 degrees under bare ground at 2 o'clock in summer afternoon versus 35 degrees. Plant root growth and other stops completely when it's above 40 degrees. So plants are dying at that time. So reducing soil evaporation. Soil evaporation. So that's one. The other part which I like to mention in terms of water and nutrient, mega cities. We haven't really talked about this at this point. Mega city is a city of 10 billion, 10 million, 10 million. City of 10 million is called mega city. Right now we have 28 mega cities in the world. They are going to be probably 40 by 2030. There'll be 83 mega cities by 2100. The largest city by 2100, you may be able to guess is Lagos, Nigeria. 83 million people. A city of 10 million, requires 6,000 tons of food per day. Remember the nitrogen, phosphorus, nutrients coming into the cities, not going back. So converting gray and black water and converting that nutrient coming into the city, recycling, growing food within the city premises by reusing those nutrients and by converting gray water back for restoration of degraded land in the vicinity of the mega city is the only solution. But we have to go back to the drawing board. That movie, remember this morning, somebody showed the toilet, I think the first speaker. I think if we could store that water, recycle those nutrients and make them as an asset rather than liability, that's a way we have to go in the direction of our plumbing. All right. All right, let's thank Dr. Lal one thank more you. time. Thank you. Thank you.